Right, welcome everyone he here this morning to the English service. And um, today we are preaching from the book of Judges. Last week we did um, Joshua, and this week we are going off to Judges. <laughs> now the reason that we are doing, one of the reasons why we are studying um, the Bible in this manner, from Genesis right unto Revelation. And we are studying it covenantally. So therefore we are unfolding the Bible covenantally from Genesis right unto Revelation. And we want to see the covenant of God that spring forth from the Bible, from all the books in, um, in the scripture. Another reason why we are doing this is to help all of you to understand why all the books are there. And last week you will remember I actually gave the, everyone a copy of this. A Robert Murray machine read the Bible in one year. Now I wonder how many of you are really starting. Right, last week I said that if you will start, so therefore if you are starting today, you will be in July the 2nd. So you will be reading Joshua chapter 4. Psalm 129 verse uh, 100, uh, Psalm uh, 119. Oh, no, Psalm 129 and 100 to Psalm 131. So you're reading three Psalms. Isaiah chapter 64 and Matthew chapter 12. Are you trying to do that? Or you want to, you can just read three, uh, three, um, uh, three columns. And this is the effect of it. Remember Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. They proceed from the mount of God and say it is from Genesis to Revelation. So if you were to take four columns from Robert McChain's uh, Bible reading plan, you will finish in one year, the Old Testament once, the New Testament twice, and Psalm twice. But he wanted to do three uh, columns, the first, second, and the third, you will finish the Old Testament once, the New Testament once, and Psalm once. So therefore, it is an exercise, not because that it is something that you are going to prove yourself uh, to, to, to earn salvation, but it's something in which every born-again Christian should do to read the Word of God. Because each time that you read, you know, someone has said that if you love God, you love this Bible, you love the Word. So every time that you open the Bible, God is speaking to you right before you. And God is with you. Just as we learn in Joshua. Well, we're going to recollect some of the things that we're going to learn in the book of Judges. So with that, turn with me to the book of Judges. For one reason or another, I... Right, we will read a chapter of the, the Bible in Judges together, and then um, I will pray. So turn with me to Judges um, chapter, we will read uh, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2 together. So with you, you have the Bible with you. Turn with me to Judges chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read it responsively. So I read one verse, you respond with the next. And stand for the reading of God's word. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you in the land that I swore to give to your father, I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. Yes. 
And they called the name of that place Buchim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who have seen all the great work that the Lord um, had done for Israel. And they buried him within the boundary of his inheritance in Timatharis and in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of God, in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord has won, and as the Lord has shown to them that they were in terrible distress. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they wore after other gods and bowed down to them. They did soon turn aside from the way in which their fathers have walked, who had obeyed the commandment of the Lord, and they did not do so. But whenever the judges died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. And they did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. So the Lord left their, this na those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Come, let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you this morning that we can come before you, a God who revealed himself through the scripture. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of hope, a God who keeps co covenants with your people, and therefore, Lord, as we read today in the book of Judges, Lord, as compared to Joshua and Judges, Lord, we wish, Lord, that we are in the book of Joshua all the time, that we may be a godly generation, a godly people. But, Lord, we see the distress, and we see, oh, Lord, the evil and the wickedness that the people of God did in the absence of God, Lord, just as they deserve the punishment in which you instill upon them, so are we, Lord. So we, Lord, as wretched as they are, we deserve, oh Lord, whatever you punish us, Lord, wait. But Lord, we want to thank you because the oh Lord, grace has come to us. The Lord, you have chosen us, Lord, as your covenant people. And that, Lord, your covenant people, even though who do not deserve the grace that you bestowed upon them, nevertheless, Lord, you have given us the Lord Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and our Master who died on the cross for us. And just as we done deserving, Lord, as we learned this morning from John Gospel, that, Lord, you have given us eternal life, Lord, and you cause us, Lord, to be regenerated, Lord, in the Spirit of God. So we thank you this morning, Lord, as we learn from your Scripture, Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that we take heed, Lord, to the warning that you have given us, Lord, in the Bible. For all this, we give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, you may be seated. Now today, we are looking at the book of Judges. And the best way to describe the book of Judges is in Judges 21 verse 25. And the last line, they say, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You know, we have only 21 chapters and we thank God that we have 21 chapters. If God would have given us 66 chapters, we would even see even more worse thing or more evil thing that the people of God would have done. But we thank God that um, we have only 21. These are dark ages compared to what we learn in Joshua. After a brilliant age, all we see that it is the godliest generation in the whole of the Old Testament. So we have turned from godliness to a wicked generation, a godly generation to wickedness in the book of Judges. So what were the themes of the book of Judges? Well, there are a couple of themes. And one most important one, number one, is this. They started well, but they ended very badly. These are the generation just after Joshua and in Joshua time in which we learn that they are strong and courageous. They are the people who look to God. They are the people who read the Bible, meditate upon the word of God day and night. And they started well as we learn in chapter 1, but they ended very badly. So what were they were asked to do? And what we were asked to do is simply this, that we are asked to build a godly culture. We are asked to do a godly culture. And we learned that from the Bible when um, in Judges chapter 1 verse 4. Turn with me to the book of Judges and we read slowly from in chapter 1. You see, after the death of Joshua, the people of God re uh, inquire of the Lord. And they are still good. They are still well or They are still godly in the sense. They inquire of God. They look to God and ask, what God, what shall we do? And they did very simple asking, what shall we, who shall go first for, the, uh, for us against Canaanite to fight against them? And the Lord said, Josh, Judah shall go. Behold, I've given the land into his hand. In other words, before even they fight, God already told them, because you inquire of us, because you are still godly as is in Joshua, I've given the land into the hand of Judah. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against Canaanites and I likewise will go with you in the territory allotted to you. So Simon went with him. And what they did was, in the Bible that tells us in verse 4 is that then Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the parasites into their hand and they defeated 10,000 of them in Bezat. Now we were not told how many people died but I don't think maybe there's none. But we were told that, hey, they came in a force of 10,000 people. It is just nothing to that because the Lord said, I already given the land into your hand. And they were a generation in which they say, you had to go into Judah and take over Jerusalem. And therefore in Judges 1 to, verse 1 to 7, they began well. They started doing well. But as we learn from the 21 chapters in Judges, 
they didn't end well. Some people say they did not end that well, but it didn't well at all because they plunged the whole nation into wickedness and in evil. So what was missing? So therefore, we need to recollect and to compare Joshua with Judges. So let us recap what we learned in the book of Joshua. Why did they start well and what they were they doing? They were actually copying or rather complying to what Joshua taught them in the book of Joshua. Remember last week we were talking about Joshua? What were the elements in which Joshua the um, Joshua have or the people of Joshua have? Well, basically we will look that they have a written book. Remember if you were with your Bible video, you turn with me to the book of Joshua. Have it in front of you and I think uh, all of you would have underlined uh, um, verses uh, uh, 7 and 8. And what they have is actually in their backpack, the Bible. So therefore, all of us would have our bag in our bag or somewhere reachable to us that we have the Bible with us and that we would turn to it day and night and meditate upon it. Look at in Joshua chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible tells the people of God, and that include us, only be strong and very courageous and be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Then the instruction came. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in you, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And that's what we learn from Joshua. They have a written book in which they dwell in it. They have only Genesis to Deuteronomy. We have more words, more revelation from God. We have Genesis to Revelation. Are we dwelling in it? Are we meditating on um, day and night on it just like the people of Joshua? And we see that the reason why they were the godliest generation is that because they meditate on it day and night. Are we doing that? And that's the reason why I've given you uh, this particular plan that you have. That you will start looking into the direction that you will meditate upon the word of the Lord day and night. They have the written word or they have a written book so have we. And the one reason why in the book of Judges that they fail is because they fail to open it. They still have the written word, but they fail to read it. They fail to meditate upon it, and they fail to obey it. So it is also for our generation here. That it is so easy that we have the book of, or the, the scripture with us. But it is in the closet, or is in the cupboard, or that we are somewhere in which we never turn to it and never read it at all. Last week we learned when from the written book we look at the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is very telling that there are only two groups of people. Most people think it is the generations um, um, who, who, who are Christian and the other one is the wicked people. All those who call, no, we learned that the demarcation point in the book of Psalms or the difference between two group of people is one group that reads the Bible and the other group did not. They have a written book. We have a written book. But the second thing in which Joshua, when the book of Joshua um, tells us or we read is that divine power is in working in their life. In the book of Joshua, I've given 
you often we heard, I've given this land into your hand. So it is in the first chapter of Judges. I've given this land to Judah. It is God who is working. The mighty power of God, the awesome power of God is working in the life of the godly people in that generation. And it is so sad that it is only in chapter 1 and a little bit of chapter 2 that God is working in the life of these people after Joshua. Remember one thing, one thing as you look in the book of Judges is that God is still with them in chapter 1. It is the same God that worked in the life of all those people in Joshua and that it is still working in them in one short chapter in chapter 1. Is God working in your life? Every time that you open the Bible, you're telling God, Lord, I'm listening to you. And today as we learn in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah prayed, Lord, you are an awesome God who keep covenant with your people. And it is the same God with the same divine power that's working in the life of Joshua, working in the life of the people in one chapter in Judges. Number three, that they have a supernatural leader, someone leading the people of God in the book of Joshua. And when we learn that in chapter five, we have the man with a drawn sword. I always love this particular chapter because it is the personification of the Lord Jesus Christ. God led them all the way. Jesus led them all the way. And Jesus still lead us all the way because Jesus said in the Great Commission that we are to make disciples of all nations. And what did he say? I will be with you always until the end of the ages. Same leader that leads them and the same leader that leads us only if we are like them, keeping commandment of God, knowing the commandment of God that is found in the Bible. But on top of that, that we have a leader, a, a supernatural leader that lead them in the Lord Jesus Christ. They also have godly leaders. And these godly leaders are the people that we read in Joshua. Joshua is the godly leaders. And many of them people who lead the, the tribes in are also godly leaders because they read the Bible. So therefore we learn that if we want to lead, we need to read the Bible and meditate upon it. So therefore as we look in the book of Judges, after chapter 1, they fail. So therefore in in verse 27, to turn with me to Judges chapter 1. In fact, they actually fail right there in chapter 1. And in from 27 to 36 onwards. So therefore, we have a godly people uh, brought forward from the book of Joshua. And finally, in the words of 27 onwards, there is something in which it is repetition all the way in the rest of the chapter. And it is, they did not. So we ask ourselves the same thing. That are we people who did not? Look at what they say. In verse 27, Manasseh did not drive. Then it says in verse 29, Ephraim did not drive. Jubilee did not drive. Asher did not drive in verse 31. 33, Naphtali, Naphtali did not drive out. In other words, there are people who did not do something. We do not want to be a generation that did not. 
We want to be a generation that do like in Joshua. So what they actually did was they disobeyed God. That, that thing we learned. They were no longer strong and courageous because they disobeyed God. And it is so telling from verse 27 on verse 36. They fail. Then what did they fail? They fail in simple commandment of God in which God tell them to do. They fail to drive out the inhabitants of the land in which they went into process. And God emphasized and warned them time again why this is so important. And therefore, the main reason why they failed in the book of Judges is because of disobedience. In Judges chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, And the angel of the Lord went up to Gilgah and to Bochin, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your father. I said, I will never break covenant with you. What a God. What an awesome God at the hip. And he said, you shall not make no covenant with the inhabitants of the, this land. You shall break down the altar. But you have disobeyed or you have not obeyed my voice. God said, what, what is this that you've done? It is the same with us. What it is that you have done? So what were the fault? What did they? What, what what did the fault of the these people? Israel allowed the Canaanites to live among them. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter twenty, he says, um, verse sixteen to eighteen. But the city in the city of these people that the Lord your God is given to you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing. That breathes. Where well, it's complete, isn't it? And you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasite, the Hevites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded. And God knows that these people are there in Israel. And God said, You are to destroy all of them. Why? Verse 18 tells us that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods and so you sin against the Lord your God. So there's a reason behind. God said, I, I know what is going to happen. If you were to go in there and you're going to leave the Hittites, Hittites with you and the Amorites with you, the Canaanites, the Parasites, all these people, you know what they're going to do? They're going to drive you to all their abominable practices which they did for their gods. Now, sometimes I just wonder what they actually did. Until you say, see some of this glaring movie in which they sacrifice humans to their gods. And then you see some of these things that they do. Then you realize that, hey, these are the things in which God warned them that they should drive them or they, no, they're going to destroy them. But they did not. So therefore, in Judges chapter 1 verse 29, and Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived, or, uh, or, of, uh, who, who lived in Giza so that the Canaanites Canaanites lived in Gaza among them. So this is what God tells them that they, they should drive them out. Now they are living with them in Gaza. And very, very soon, their culture will become the predominant culture among them. Verse 30. Jebulant, uh, Jebulant did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Naholo, so that the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to the forced labor. They think that everything was fine. Right? We are forcing them to labor against us. But the warning is always there, remember, in Deuteronomy. Take this book of the law and put it by the sight of the act of covenant of the Lord your God and that is it may be therefore a witness against you 
You told me chapter 31, verse 26, 29. God knows. God gave them the Ark of Covenant. This is the law. Put it there. You remind you, do not do it. And they continue to do it. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. That's what God knows about them. They, God, God raised them up. God chose them. But God knows their heart. And God knows our heart too. Live alone without the Bible, you will fall. Because we are going to be just like them, rebellious and stubborn. Stubborn people don't like to read the Word of God. Rebellious people will rebel against God. Why would I need to know your Word? Even today that I'm yet alive with you, God say, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more? After my dad, that is George, Joshua said, Assemble to me, uh, uh, Moses, assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your offices that I may speak this word in, the, in their ears and I call heaven and earth to witness against them. And then this is what the warning comes in. For I know that after my dad, that Moses dad, you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to to come evil will before you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. So what was the contrast between Joshua and, and Judges? One hand, it is a godly nation. The other hand, is the wicked nation. And the wicked nation, the wickedness we heard about, it is the same weakness word that we found in Psalm 1. Those who do not read God's word. Second thing that they, they did was the Israelites this. Israel allowed the children to live among the Canaanites. So not that they allowed their children to play with their children. So the Israelites in verse chapter, chapter 1 verse 32 live among the Canaanites. The inhabitants of the land so they did not drive them out. So not with they're going to go into the culture in which their children will play with their children. Or in today, we will send them to the same school. They will go down to play with the same thing. And then we did not teach them and they will fall. Just like these people in Judges. Israel allowed the Canaanite to dominate them. Listen to verse 34. The Amorites pressed, uh, pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country for did not allow them to come down to the plain. Now it's not, the dog, now, now it's not God who can drive them out. Now it is the Canaanites or the people are going to dominate against them. So another, an, another generation had passed who do not know God. They did not, what happened? They did not pass it on. Why all this thing is there? In Judges, in Judges, uh, the next verse that I can mention, and these are the nation of the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is all in Israel who have not experienced all the wars in Canaan. And the reason why all this is there and all the things that is happening in us is that God wants to test us. Test us that we are indeed Godly in the Lord. So the next thing that we ask is, where are these judges? So now after chapter 1, chapter 2, we have a lot of judges all the way until we meet up with the verse that we had formed, the title of our sermon. What was the title of the sermon? Right? Everyone did. Right? Um, everyone uh, did what was right in his own eye because there was no king. So the judges were real judges. They are also military command, commanders, leaders, and also prophets. So therefore, we find that in just, uh, chapter, chapter 3, and then you go back and read it, whenever God tests them, God sends people to oppress them, to persecute them. And they will come back to God. Lord, we cannot stick it anymore. Can you please come and help? And then God will send the judges or the military commanders. And then everything will be all right again. And while the commander or the judges are alive, everything is fine. 
because everyone maybe reads the Bible for themselves. But when the judges died, when the commander died, everything reverted to the same thing again. It goes like a cycle in Judges, the book of Judges. And the next thing you know, that God sent. Remember, it is God who sent them to test them. And they changed. And then when they, they worshipped the bells and all there is, God, they pray to God. They plead to God. And God sent another judge. God sent another leaders that they would deliver them. So what do we make of it? In other words, there is all these judges help us to point to one ultimate judge. And that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. All these are temporal. And then they die. Things back go back to evil. And then after that, they, pr they plead with God. God sent another judge. But there is an ultimate judge that's going to come. This morning as we were going to Nehemiah, remember, everything functions or everything happens the way that God decreed. And this is the downturn that we're going to see in the book of Judges all the way. After that, that we see it in Samuel that we have a king. This is the 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 theocracy that we are in right now. And finally, we're preparing the way so that the ultimate judge that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ would come. In Hebrew chapter 2, verse 7 to 8, he talked about Jesus Christ. You make him for a uh, you made him for a little while lower than the angel. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Put everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. In other words, it points, points to it, the ultimate judge that we're going to come, and that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then it points that in Revelation, it tells us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, and Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of kings on earth, to him who loved us and has freed us from our sin of his blood. Revelation 11, 15, when the seven angel blew, blew, his, uh, blew its thumb trumpet and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. The judges reign for a short time, but our Lord, the ultimate judge, the ultimate king will reign forever and ever. Well, just like um, we end in the book of Judges, they have no king. So therefore, um, the verse that we end, uh, the verse that end um, Judges, they say, in those days there were no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So if there is no king in your, in your life, what happened? Exactly like the people in the book of Judges. The word of God is rejected. His presence is, is no. They never knew that it was God leading them. Because they never spent time with God. That's why things went so bad during this period of time. And every other period from now till the New Testament time. It was not good. It was all down with all the world, only with an exception of some good king that comes along as we learn in history in the books of King. But it would never be good until we have an ultimate king, and that is the king of heaven who comes to rule. And therefore we find that in the book of Judges, they have an upturn and then we have a downturn. And then we're going to learn in history, the history of the Old Testament, that they ultimately ask for a king. And God told Samuel, give them the king that they want. They have rejected me. And we're going to see that in 1 Samuel, they rejected me. 
Then we have King Saul. King Saul was not the one. And in King David, we have the King, the King David, the dynasty that brings along, finally points towards the ultimate king. So what was happening down there? Just as we learn, we're going to learn further why is happening the days. This, this, this wickedness that uh, transposed in this land in which God gave them, supposedly to the land flowing with milk and honey. They rejected God. They rejected the word of God and they rejected the king of heaven. And they want to ask for the earthly king that God will comply with them. So therefore, this is what we learn from the book of Judges. So each time that we turn to the book of Judges, and every chapter that we read in the book of Judges, sometimes the Judges uh, reign a bit longer, but ultimately we always come to the conclusion, Lord, let us not be like them. Let us read the word of God for ourselves. Let us look towards the Lord Jesus Christ, our the ultimate king. And this king is none other than the king of our life. They failed. They're not like the godly nation in Joshua. From a godly nation, they become a, a wicked nation. So how do we apply all that we have learned in these 21 chapters in Judges. So now that we didn't go through all the Judges, but we give you enough so that when you go through your devotion in the morning and that you read one chapter by chapter in Judges, you would know what is transpired in those, in those words. And that we know that, hey, this is what is being uh, uh, reflected in the life of these people Ask God that it will not happen to you, that you would have a desire and a delight in God's word. And every time that you delight in God's word, you know there is a God who is always present with you, just like the people in the book of Joshua. So therefore, how do we apply all that we're going to have learned so far? Well, we learned that in the book of Joshua, that they are asked to build a godly culture. We are also asked to build a godly culture. And the thing that we are going through in the church, it is not just simply that, oh, Sunday I come to church and it is my obligation and this is my responsibility. I think I come to church. But you are learning things. You are learning the, 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 the authority of the the, uh, the Bible, you're learning all that instruction that is found in the Bible to build a godly culture in church, in your workplace, and in your family place. Just like them, they are not careful. And if we are not careful to open God's word and learn from it, and not interested in it, we will fall just like the people in the book of Judges. So there are two things in which we're going to see in application. Number one, do not be unequally yoked with unbeliever. We're not going to be like a monastery that you gave. We're not, you're going to be there, but don't get too close, like the, like this book of, and the judges right now, right? And we learn from the book of Judges. We learn to worship like them. I can imagine that uh, a, a church would tell you that, hey, it's okay. You have your, you can have your, 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 your altar in the house. Careful, syncretism that creep into the life of Christians. And also people who call themselves believers. No. There are people who tell you that it is not necessary. Right? All those who fall into the people call antinomianism. They say, no, the law doesn't apply to us anymore. We don't have to do them. 
Or there are people who tell you, hey, no need la, the word of God. We, we believe in Jesus Christ who died on our cross and the, who, who, who died on the cross for our sin, and that's it, la, enough. La. Careful. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers and also people who call themselves believers. How do we know? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 16. You know, often we of the first thing that we learn about this is that oh, this is his marriage or new. So easy, isn't it? Ah, this, this boy cannot marry this, 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 this uh, girl or this girl cannot marry this person who is not a Christian. And, and that's all the, op, all the application there is. But listen deeper. You know, you know the, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 16, the first application is to be with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So he's still telling you, isn't it? If the other side got no light, how could light and darkness come together? What accord has Christ with Belial? And what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And we are the temple of the living God. As God say, I will make my dwelling among them and walk, am uh, walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now many people go the other direction. Oh, since we are not unequally going, that's not going to work in the office where there they are all these un-Christians -Christ around. So what is the antidote behind all this thing? If you do not know the Bible well, you will fall. In one sense, that they, um, God tells them they are right, that they should destroy all the Canaanites, the parasites, the Hittites. That's the best thing to do. But if you are among them, if they continue to be like the godly generation in Joshua, that they meditate upon the word of God day and night. What will happen to them? God tells us, man. In Psalm 1, what did God tell us? In Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, God tells us, if you do that, then you are like a, you're like a tree planted by the stream of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prosper. The word of God transform, change. And that's what they did to the, the godly generation in Joshua. And the moment when you lift your eyes off, then you fall. Someone tell us a whole generation that's the, who don't read the Bible. Where are they like? The wickers are not so. And like a shaft that he, the, the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. God tells us in, in, Judge, in Judges chapter 2. And all that the generation that were gathered to their father, there arose in another generation after them. Not only that they say that they did not read the Bible, they say that this generation did not know the Lord or the work that is done for Israel. Whether you write to look at it from Genesis or any book in the Bible, it always points back to one simple thing. That's the Bible. It is the authority of the Bible in your life. How do we do people in the last verse in Judges say, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They got no king. If God is not the king of your life, you will not open the Bible. And if you not open the Bible, you do everything that is right in your own eyes and not in what the Bible teaches. 
You do not know the word of God. You do not know God. Remember one thing we were taught, teaching the, uh, the people in the study in theology? Many, many generations before in the Reformation, that they are contented with all the truth that is found in the Bible. And they found that, hey, there are certain things that is heresy. And today, heresy becomes orthodoxy. And that is the standard the church are going through today. Careful. They may call themselves Christian, but they are sheep in reverence, rev in sheep clothing. Careful. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes are people who do not trust the Bible at all, who don't read the Bible. The second thing that is more telling about this generation is this. Then in the book of Deuteronomy, it was so telling that Moses has the plan. Oh, go, go, Moses elected all um, place into his hand, the successor for him. And there's none of Joshua. And Joshua was elected or ordained to, for Moses to pass the baton on to Joshua. But Joshua didn't. There is no successor in the book of Judges, or rather after Joshua passed away. And Joshua just says, uh, continue that all those during the time, there are still those who are godly elders. And when the godly elders pass away in chapter 1, everything went downhill. So when they were still there, they were still good. But there was no succession. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7, he says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. This part, go tell them. And you shall, you shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Teach them to your children. And that's what we're doing. Remember you walk into the first floor you see a chart there. They accumulate the number of people coming to Bible school, Sunday school, 400 over. We are imparting, we are teaching children or even adults, consider them to children. And the idea is when we have the new building, we have another 50, children, uh, 50 Sunday school room. And when everything falls in part in 10 years from now, we would have 1,500 people coming for Sunday school. And that is, you shall teach them diligently to your children. But we must begin now. Why not? We must begin to tell people, other people who are Christian, who never teach their children, we are teaching our children. Come. We did in biblical theology from Genesis to, to Revelation. We are preaching from the word of God every, every Sunday morning and we are unfolding the covenant of God. Tell them, come and learn. Without the word of God, everything would turn like judges. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 46, take you to the heart all the words by which I'm warning you today that you may command them to your children that they may be careful to do all the word of this law. Now, the interesting with this word contrast with the word that we have in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is this. It says, command. That you may command them to your children. If your children doesn't take command when they are 6 years old, 9 years old, 16 years old, and when they are 21 years old, you cannot command them anymore. Teach them while they are young. But the conclusion of this part is this. Nothing can thwart God. Nothing can stop God. 
even though that an evil generation would come up, even though a godly day leaders who did not pass on the succession, God's plan will continue even without a leader. Even in spite of all that is happening before us in from Judges right until Malachi, God's agenda, God's placement of things that's going to happen for you and I, that the Savior would come just as was foretold, just at the right time that he will come and die on the cross so that you and I would be redeemed. Even though the failing of people who didn't take heed to God's word. But of course, if we follow God's word and his commandment, things won't run smoothly like what we learned in Joshua. But when things fall apart, like in the book of Judges and all the way to Malachi, God can still do his bidding. God will still bring forth, even despite, in spite of all that happened, the Savior came on time. All glory to God in heaven. Praise to God. This is what God do. So therefore we learn this, uh, this morning that we look for it. Do not be unequally yoked with the unbelievers. But the best thing is not to be unequally yoked. But we know our God and our doctrine. And we need to pass on to our next generation. Are we doing that? But the danger is that. That the glaring among to us is that a godly nation, a godly generation, would be success, succeeded by a wicked generation. And we thank God that God didn't give us more than 21 chapters to look into the wickedness of men. Come, let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for the word that you have given to us in the book of Judges. A reminder for us, a warning to us, that we will have to take heed to study your word and to read your word. Lord, help us, Lord, to be people having a righteous call to build a godly generation, a godly culture, both here in our church and in our family and wherever we are, Lord, in our workplace. Help us, Lord, to be strong and courageous like the generation in Joshua. And let us not depart from the word of God. For all this, we give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.